This week on the WriterCon podcast. It would be that it's actually really freeing that for most people, the stakes are really low when you're writing something. So you can feel free to experiment, to try new things, because what's the worst that could happen? Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich, and hello, writers. Okay, we're going to start with a follow-up to a previous story. Renee, you remember the story you actually re- recommended? We talked about the huge success of Colleen Hoover. I remember, I think, <laughs> yep, I do. Okay, so I was traveling in Egypt, as you guys know, Egypt, a couple weeks ago, and we're on this tour bus, and we stop at a gas station, bathroom break, and there are books to, for sale, a lot more than you'd probably see at a gas station here, typically. Most of them are in Arabic, but what's the one English language author that I recognize? Jesse, do you have that photo that I sent you? Yep, there she is, Colleen Hoover, all over the place, outside Cairo, for Pete's sake. It seems the power of TikTok extends even to the banks of the Nile. Okay, I got to insert here. My whole life, my dream was to be on an airplane and see somebody reading my book. (laughs) My whole life, like my whole life as an author, never happened. Saw my friend's books, um, Mm -hmm. but never saw one of mine, so... Congratulations, Colleen, but I'm still bitter. I still want to see somebody reading my book on an airplane. Look how Uh, many different of her books are there, too. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even notice that the first time. I I, I even cropped this photo so you could see them better. I didn't realize the entire row is her books. I've never seen anybody reading me on an airplane. I did see somebody in a restaurant reading one of my books once, and I stupidly went over and introduced myself, and she kind of looked like, would you go away? I'm reading a book. Anyway. I definitely edited part of one of your audiobooks on an airplane. Does that count? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Sure. Well, anyway, so there, she's not only the number one best-selling author by a huge margin this year in the United States, She's made it to Egypt as well. That is the power of persistence, writers. That's why I end every podcast by telling you to keep writing and be persistent because it pays off. The power of the written word is incredible. Commit to your work and stick to it. All right. Our guest today is the author of a new book that's related to a historical incident that's always fascinated me and apparently has fascinated her as well. Henriette Lazaridis is the author of Terra Nova about the, or it relates to, she'll talk more about that later, but it relates to the story of the British explorer in the Antarctica, Robert Falcon Scott. It's set in 1910 and I can't wait to talk more about this, but first the news. Speaking of TikTok, TikTok is going to start selling books directly because apparently it's not selling enough books indirectly. So now it's going to sell them directly from its own marketplace. As you know well, if you've been listening to this podcast, TikTok has proved to be a hugely successful way to promote books. And now in the UK, they're going to sell books directly directly. They've announced partnerships with publishers like HarperCollins and others selling directly from a TikTok-based online marketplace. Uh, Those new partnerships do mark the first time that users have been able, there have been links before, but this will be the first time they've been able to buy books directly from TikTok. So any merchant signed up in the TikTok shop can advertise and sell products within that app. Now, some of you with memories will remember, well, all of you have memories, the better memories or the consistent listeners to the podcast will remember when we talked about the story uh, about Penguin Random House having an exclusive TikTok partnership 
which allows people to actually link, like when they're posting or talking about it, they can link to the book someplace else where they could actually buy it or on the Penguin Random House website. But now you can actually buy the book there. Apparently one more step in TikTok's plan to dominate the <laughs> book world. Renee, uh, you think this is going to be significant to book sales? Yep. I think uh, <laughs> succinct. I like listen, that. Listen, as a consumer, I can't. I can't comment as a business person. I'm assuming this will be fantastic. But as a consumer, the less clicks that I have to go through, the more chance I'm going to buy something. Sure. If I can directly click and go, boom, pay for it through Apple Pay and get it, mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be so dangerous for me. <laughs> and. Um, I don't know. I think it's a brilliant move. I mean, mm -hmm. good grief. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could get more people on TikTok talking about my books. This is. Uh, yeah. I how mean, do we do that? What's, no, how do we get, Jesse, how do we do that? Don't I mean, to, first I, of all, I have to be on TikTok. I realize yeah. that. But I mean, <laughs> once I get on there. <laughs> I'm constantly battling whether to spend time learning how to do TikTok. Also, knowing that it might, the United States government might, might make it illegal and shut it down at any point. So right. I'm like, do I spend time learning mm -hmm. how to do this or not? I mean, the cliche is that everybody on TikTok is young and female and reading romancy kind of books, but that cannot be. There are more than a billion users on TikTok. That cannot be true. They've got to be a much wider spectrum of readers than that. And a lot um, of people are just passive TikTok users who are just watching watching vi the, the videos and the talks or whatever they're called um, and not actually posting any of themselves. So like, it's really hard to gauge who is actually there. Well, I know some people do, pay, you know, uh, you get social media consultants to handle because you realize it's important, but you'd rather be writing a book. Uh, yeah, we're probably going to see some TikTok specialists at, mm. at WriterCon this yeah. year. Yeah. What a yeah. Sharon yeah. thing are, TikTok. Yeah, they're already around. Yeah, we need to get somebody there. Let's do that, Bill. Let's get right. somebody. We need an expert. I don't know who that is. We'll find him. Okay, on the list. News story number two, which honestly, you've probably already heard this, but we've been talking about it for a year. So I thought we had to touch on the fact that the Simon & Schuster sale to Penguin Random House has fallen apart, apparently for good. Uh, it's all come to an end. We reported previously that a judge blocked the deal on antitrust grounds. There would still, of course, be an opportunity to appeal within a set deadline, dead, deadline, but apparently they have decided not to do that. Simon & Schuster's parent company, which of course is Paramount, Paramount Global, has decided just not to do it. So they're probably thinking that it would be pointless. Uh, to be clear, the company is still for sale. It's just not going to the most likely purchaser, uh, the largest publisher in the English-speaking world, Penguin Random House. So who's the new buyer going to be? Is it going to be HarperCollins or Hachette or uh, a private equity firm like is currently running Barnes & Noble or some other surprising player? Anybody got any speculation? I mean, it'd be hilarious if the people who own Barnes & Noble bought it because like that... <laughs> Because that 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 would technically be that would kind of be like the AT and T Warner Brothers merger, which also was terrible. But like, right. it was you know two parts of getting it to the consumer people merging versus two people who were competing uh, com in competition merging. Um, right. Or maybe no one will buy it, and Paramount will just have to keep it. I think you should buy it, Jesse. Didn't we, didn't we talk about this? You just scrap together some spare change, yeah. and yeah, uh, I'll go. How I'll much, sell a few comic be? books, yeah. and yeah. Now, Colleen Hoover needs to buy it. She can yeah. afford it. Oh, she could hilarious. do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. uh, let's somebody write her. That would yeah. be uh, the best move, I think. Um, I don't, I mean, Renee, do you, you're in the film world. Do you, why are they even selling it? It does make money. Is it just not relevant to what Paramount primarily does, you think? Or what's Bill, what's, did you seriously just ask me that question? I could not ever understand what is going on in the business world at the Paramount level of why they, I, You're I, my film insider. I, I don't even understand how the film world works. I can write a movie. <laughs> I don't understand anything after that. Um, that's not true. I understand a little bit, but that's a high level decision. You've got a I, movie on Netflix right now for Pete's sake, right? Yeah. Family I camp. Do. 
Yeah, but I'm not a producer. I'm it's just a writer. Too. I'm just a low. I'm a low end, low, low, low end on the total. Pl- what is? What am I trying to say? You're I'm a low writer, on the totem pole. I'm just a writer. <laughs> the low yeah, end I can't the also pole? find words. So, but uh, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I would imagine there's a good reason, but <laughs> and it probably involves money. That's all yeah. I can. Uh, that's I'll all see, I can contribute you, to this you, conversation. You have but yeah, it's probably I'm not making enough money. Yeah, it's probably right. not making enough money, and uh, to impress the movie some, people. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, movie people don't read books, so that's yeah. Also, like problem. the movie movie people normally like to spend a lot of money that they don't get back, and then blame it on other people, and then just make another movie. So, <laughs> yeah. movie accounting is fascinating, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh like, my god, like, it's it's fascinating how no no movie can make money. <laughs> yeah, no, my, and like sometimes the marketing costs are included, sometimes they're not included, mm-hmm. sometimes they're only included if the movie's doing mm-hmm. well. It's like, I'm I, like, how do you... There's one guarantee. The writer won't make money. So there's... Because <laughs> right. the movie never makes money, so yeah. they, they never get residuals. Well, they, they're saying that the second Avatar movie has to has to clear $2 billion for it to uh, get its money back, and I'm like... Two billion? Two billion. Which only three movies have done so far. So one of them is Avatar. So, you know, maybe. Um, That's a lot of money for a movie that looks like a very long computer game. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, again, everyone saw the first one somehow. Again, none of us remember the plot. I remember. Nobody liked the first one, did they? I thought (laughs) thought it was a failure. My son Ralph did, but he was eight, to be fair. We we didn't like it. It, it wasn't a failure in the sense that it didn't make money. It was a failure in the sense that it just didn't have any cultural cachet. Right. Hmm. Like, Like a Jurassic Park or mm-hmm. uh, like you know, the Lord of the Rings movies like had cultural stuff built around them afterwards. Uh, the first Avatar movie had nothing; it just went away, mm-hmm. and uh, people blamed yeah. James Cameron for bad 3D movies, which wasn't his fault. And uh, <laughs> I used to hate him, and now I'm and now I'm actually on his side because um, he's like he's like look at the first Avatar movie and look at the most recent Marvel movie, and you tell me which CGI looks better. And he's right; his movie looks better. Uh, mm. cause he didn't rush them. He, he likes to yell at people apparently to not rush him. I wish I had that kind of power, <laughs> right? Where his, his film <laughs> company see, you calls him. You can yell at us if you want. No, I mean, no, I, it's no. totally fine. We I kind of, I, I kind of yelled uh, to Bill in an email yesterday, but, uh, <laughs> Ooh, was it all caps? <laughs> it was not all caps. Like, I don't then like, you know, that's, uh, true power is yelling without caps. Uh, <laughs> that's a, hey, that is a quote. Yeah. I need that on a t-shirt. That sounds good. All right. We've got a great interview for you today. So, Jesse, let's get crackalacking. Henriette Lazaritis's new novel, Terra Nova, was just released by Pegasus Books. It, can, it relates to British explorer Robert Scott and his exploration of the Antarctica, but involves new characters and a new take on the situation. She's also the author of the best-selling novel, The Clover House, which is a historical book set during World War II, largely in Greece, which is the home of her ancestors. And her short work has appeared in, or is forthcoming in a host of publications, including Forge and the New York Times. Henriette, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. I'm glad to be here. All right. We have a traditional first question because there are a lot of writers and aspiring writers listening to this. So if you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Mm, It would be that it's actually really freeing that for most people, the stakes are really low (laughs) when you're (laughs) writing something. So you can feel free to experiment, to try Mm. new things, because what's the worst that could happen? For most people, there's no consequence to doing something that you then have to change or Mm -hmm. start over with. So why not, knowing that, why not just go for broke from the very beginning? Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, tell us about your new book, Terra Nova. So Terra Nova is the story of two fictional Antarctic explorers in a race to be first at the South Pole. And back in London in 1910, this is happening, uh, the woman who is married to one of them and is the lover of the other is a photojournalist getting involved in the suffrage movement and also very ambitious about how she can sort of explore in her way with her photography, with her art. 
Now, I'm getting confused. I, I, uh, there's some connection here to the actual Antarctic explorer Robert Scott, right? Yes. I mean, this is a world in which Scott exists. And in 1910, he's already done his first exploration in Antarctica, the Discovery Expedition. Hmm. But I've slotted the narrative into place before the actual Robert Scott went on what is called his Terra Nova expedition, which was the race with Amundsen. So this is taking an sort of an alternate moment because Scott was in my mind, he was a heroic figure. He was a flawed, highly flawed figure, but, and he lost the race with Amundsen, but he behaved, I would say honorably. And what always interested me was what, what happens When you get to the South Pole, you achieve your physical goal of arriving at that destination and you realize that someone else's flag is already there Mm. and you've been beaten. And I, Scott did the right thing. He was congratulatory of his rival. But what if you weren't? And so I couldn't use Scott because Scott had done all the well, he had he had acted well. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in someone who might not act well. So this is somebody who comes before that comes before Scott in your yeah. alternate history. So it's really a science fiction novel. Is that what you're <laughs> saying? It's a science fiction novel in which <clears throat> the suffrage movement is real and there's hunger strikers and ask with his prime minister. It's all real. Uh, okay. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating to me to merge history and fiction um, into one novel. And how, how do you, how do you make sure that you're true to the history? Like how much creative license are you taking or how, how do you ap- approach it? Because I've, I've, I've seen it done and I've always wondered, are there any rules to this? Or is once you enter the fiction realm, do you get to do what you get to do? Yeah, I mean, I think if I had Scott as a character, which in an earlier draft, I had a scene where the Viola who is in London encounters scott at an event okay. and um and i i took that out it, it just it didn't need to once you're including scott it's become it becomes a little more complicated right. so i think so you know i i refer to historical events uh, sort of on the periphery or not historical events historical figures like um emmeline pankhurst the suffragette christabel her daughter the prime minister those kinds of figures but i think if i were to completely alter their behavior that would be strange everybody would mm-hmm. say, no but they didn't do that so mm-hmm. i'm sort of working my fictional characters around within the reality that is that is sort of concrete and known to us and sticking them in there oh interesting so, what got you started on that i mean this sounds like a really somewhat complex project and you just talked about t- taking risks and and clearly you are here so Oh, what, did you have a particular goal in mind? What were you going for here? I've been fascinated with Robert Scott since I was mm-hmm. seven. Yeah, and I saw a documentary about him and I really, he became kind of my hero. And at seven, I didn't understand all the ways in which he was a flawed leader and the decisions he made that he could have made differently and maybe survived. But but I've I've long been fascinated with him and, and been then, as I grew older, fascinated with that question of what if you got there and you didn't do the honorable thing? And also, what did it feel like for him? What did it feel like mm-hmm. to get to the South Pole, to be nearly dying and see this object in a complete wilderness where there's no other human element in any way? And then you see this flag. <laughs> like, come on. I came all this way. Mm-hmm. So I, I could never really shake that question. And at some point, I just thought, I, as with so many novels that we write, it, it becomes a question of, I can't stop thinking about this, so it has to come out in writing. Um, and I began with the narrative of the men, and I began at a point where I was feeling, like literally in the month before I began the book, I, was, I knew I wanted to start writing it, but I was very nervous. Talk about risks. I was feeling as though I had to get it just right, because I had written another book that my agent hadn't been able to sell, which at the time I didn't realize how common that is. Right. It happens to all of us. But I just sort of felt as though, oh, no, what if I put a foot wrong again? Mm-hmm. And so I had to kind of talk myself into getting started. And I started with the men. I put, I mean, the first sentence of the published novel is actually the first sentence that I wrote on like December 2nd of twenty. 20- 16 or whenever it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just wrote 
their story to get them to the moment when I knew that they were going to do something problematic. Um, and once I was done with that, then I had the problem of, well, I know there's Viola. I know she's having an affair with James Watts and she's married to Edward Haywood. And she actually believes that in her way that she should be able to love both these men at once. Although she's not being fully honest because if she really believed that she wouldn't be hiding the affair, but that's, mm. that's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> But I knew that I wanted her to be back in London experiencing a kind of weird freedom from having these men in her life that she wants them to come back. She wants them to come back alive. But she's also realizing that, hey, while they're gone, I'm actually able to do things that I couldn't do while they were here. Um, and that was a little harder for me to get into to sort of figure out exactly how she would express herself, what her art would look like um, and what her political involvement would be. There's something I wanted to follow up on, if I can, because you were brave enough to mention it. And I know there are a lot of aspiring writers listening who'll be interested in this because your first book, The Clover House, was very successful. And are you saying after that there was a manuscript your agent couldn't sell? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a very different book because I wanted to do something very different. Um, it was a sort of a sadder, darker book. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, I mean, these things, there's, I do think the book was flawed and I'd like to revisit it sometime. But yeah, it happens. And I think it's just a reminder that the in the publishing world, it it comes down so often to finding one person who will go to bat with you. And that would be your mm -hmm. agent if you have one. You don't always have to have one. Um, and then one more, you know, the editor. And I'm simplifying because, of course, the editor has to convince the sales team and the marketing team that this is actually going to earn money for the publishing house. So I, I am oversimplifying. But but it certainly requires a lot of serendipity. What is the mm, yes. what are the editors in the mood for at that particular time? What um, what are they maybe even looking for? Did they just publish something that was similar and they love your book, but they can't do something very similar. It comes down to certainly skill. You have to have written a good story, but there is, I know so many people who have written beautiful, beautiful, beautiful books and mm -hmm. they can't find publication. It, it's, it's maddening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so would you consider yourself a multi-genre writer? You write what you're interested in, in the moment, what you're passionate about I suppose. No, I wouldn't say, I think genre, I mean, I've never, um, I've never written a full on, you know, a detective novel or a mystery novel. Um, and so I suppose I occupy the genre of the literary novel, but also here I am with a historical novel and it's a, it's its own thing. Um, but yeah, it sometimes worries, not worries me, but I sometimes think, Oh, shouldn't all my books be about Greece because my first novel hmm. was set mostly in Greece or almost entirely in Greece. So I think, shouldn't I have a brand? Shouldn't I have been consistent? But I don't, I don't want, I, I want to write what I want to write. <laughs> you don't want to be the great yes. writer. Huh? Right. No, these ideas come to me and I'm like, okay, this is what I want to write. So like my, the book I'm working on now is set in 1972. And it's about a 26 year old woman physicist who's working on, or wants to be working on a, a, a new fusion project. And it does have a bit of a crime thing to it because her mother disappeared when she was 10. So, like, there's no continuity between mm -hmm. Terra Nova That's and awesome. that book. I love it. Well, do you think that it's important for writers to be happy? Like, you know, I know a, writer, a lot of writers who seem like they feel like they're forced into a genre for the rest of their career. I feel differently about it. It sounds like you do, too. Yeah. I always say to my students and to myself, too, that the only reward for doing this that you can guarantee is your own pleasure in doing the writing that's good and so because you you don't know what's going to happen beyond sitting down and having a good time even though it's you know you have your hard days and you have your easy days but fundamentally if you are enjoying the project that's your reward the rest is gravy because you can't control that at all so you mm. better be enjoying the project you don't want to be the person saying I'm going to write a vampire novel. I mean, that would be very passe right now, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to write a vampire novel because that's what everybody wants right now. If mm -hmm. you hate vampire novels, why would you do that? Right. But there that's are people who do, they chase the trend and it's almost always a mistake. It is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially because it takes time and trends, the very nature of a trend is that it's going <laughs> to fade. So yep. you can't catch that wave. 
And if it's something you don't care about, how well is it going to turn out? It's clear to me that you're writing on subjects that you're passionate about, like mm -hmm. Scott and Greece and, and the Clover House is set during World War II, isn't it? It is. I mean, most of it takes place in, in sort of the contemporary time, but there are chapters that go back to World War II. Yeah. Yeah. Well, WriterCon, both the podcast and the actual convention that we have every fall, is dedicated to helping new writers achieve their goals, whatever they may be. And I know you've spent a lot of time teaching writers as well. I, I read that you've uh, been on Grub Street in Boston and even have done workshops in Greece, right? Yeah. What draws you to that kind of work, which I know from experience is challenging? Oh, I love it. I really love it. I, I, I Teaching, especially this kind of teaching where it's people who have come be because they want to be there. It's not, you know, they're not in college, not, not to disparage college students. I taught college students for tw 10 years, no, 15 years. But these are people who are stepping up and saying, I want to take time you know, three hours a week to work on my fiction. And what I love is their commitment to it. And I also love how each group, I like to make teams. I'm an athlete and I love being on teams. And I like, especially in this solitary pursuit of writing, to create these moments when people come together and participate in a team. And it's wonderful to see people who, especially even on a Zoom after the first class, they're connecting, they're talking to each other about their mm -hmm. work. They're just, it's so cool. And especially when I learned from students afterwards that they've continued to have workshop groups that are still meeting, you know, two, three years later. And mm -hmm. that it is- stayed in touch. They stay in touch and yeah. they're sharing pages and it's, it's wonderful. And I always have repeat students. And so there's repeat students in one class who are meeting new students or different repeat students. And it's so exciting to me. And of course, the subject matter is wonderful because you're always, we're workshopping pages and we do, I'll, depending on the format of the class, there's a craft talk that I'll do for like the first right. half hour. Um, but the pages, when we get down to sharing pages, it's so wonderful to see all these incredible stories that people are working on that they're you know in different stages but there's, it's always an interesting story. Everybody's got a story. I just think yeah. everybody has a story to tell. And it's just a question of helping people find the way to tell their story the best way they can. See, this is where we've got something in common. Because I've taught English at a Midwest City Community College. And you've taught English at Harvard. <laughs> 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 Which is practically exactly the same, same thing, I'm sure. Pretty much. Yeah. It's the same. What was that like? <laughs> It was wonderful. It was a lot of work. It was, you know, I was in my late 20s through late 30s. And it was a time when I had small kids and it was like, I barely slept. Um, <laughs> but my students were remarkable. They, you know, they really were. Um, but they're, but, you know, remarkable, no differently remarkable than the students I teach now. Um, they came in with a, a, a great level of, of polish and they were very interesting people. Um, but no, it was, it was very hard work. And I was, I, I want to say I was never, um, it was interesting. I was never tenure track. I was, I came in with a term appointment, which then was extended because I became a teaching dean. Um, and so really when I, you know, I taught at Harvard, I taught in the classroom and I also taught outside the classroom as well, because I was the dean for 300 undergraduates. And so that was a really interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so one of the most often asked questions that I get is, uh, what does your writing day look like? I think people really want to know, you know, it's a very solitary job, and yeah. uh, you're not necessarily writing with people, although that's trending a little bit more now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what does your typical writing day look like? Okay, I'm out of my groove right now, but my typical, like, favorite writing day looks, I wish I could do this more, but my favorite writing day, and I know I'm dodging your question because you're asking my typical day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, however you want to answer this is fine. Yeah. yeah, no, but my, my favorite day is getting up very early, like at five or 5.30 and, and sitting at, not at my desk, but like out at the dining table and writing. I write, I like to write longhand. I write my first drafts longhand. And so really? I like, yeah, wow. yeah, it's, I didn't, 
I started it with Terra Nova. I, and it was one of those things where it's like, I need to shake something up. That book didn't sell. I need to shake it up. And so I went back to longhand and I've never looked back since. Um, so I sit with my moleskine. That sounds so pompous, but I like the soft cover. Hey, that matters. Ones. Yes. Yeah, it's the, it's yeah. cool. the big ones. And I, and, and I like, cause you can fold it back and you can take uh -huh. it with you and it's always offline. It is uh -huh. always on focus mode, right? A piece of right. paper. <laughs> Um, but I, I like to write when it's dark outside and, you know, maybe till about 7, 7.30 and then um, and then have breakfast and start the rest of the day. And that's something you can I can fit that in. My classes don't start till 10.30 and I don't teach every day of the week. I only teach two days a week. Um, but that's sort of my perfect day. I'm actually trying in the last couple of years to tell myself to go slow. Um, I've been. I, I want to be mindful of not rushing through projects. And so mm -hmm. I might say to myself, you know, you have from five to seven this morning, it's okay if you only write 250 words or if you only write 500 words because they add up instead of this sort of pressure of if I can finish the draft in X number mm -hmm. of months, that means if I do 1500 words a day and blah, 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 it works for some people. Mm -hmm. But and I'm capable of doing it, but I'm trying to see if I can go little by little by little. Well, so that's, that's what I was. Well, I wanted to ask you before we move on to the next question, because this is really fascinating to me. OK, so longhand, like I've almost lost complete skill of writing longhand. I mean, I try to just <laughs> write notes. My hand starts cramping, you know, I just can't. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so slow. It feels so slow when I'm writing. You kind of yeah. touched on that. Um, does. I'm trying to picture myself writing longhand. I can see what you mean. It becomes real intentional um, and yeah. slower. Yeah. And you sort of have to live in the moment because we can all type fast. Writers can all type fast, right? right. And we're zooming through our thoughts. So this sounds like it's been a pretty remarkable change for you. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the truth is that when you if I look at my notebooks, I can see places where the writing gets really messy because I am writing faster. Mm -hmm. um, and then places where it's all tidy. And, and so mm -hmm. uh, you get better at it because I, okay. I agree with you. When I first started this, like I'm going to do longhand, I can see those pages. I have them. They're right over there in my office. And it, the writing is kind of ill-formed, <laughs> even <laughs> right? like within my style. It's like messy. Um, and so you actually physically get better at doing it and you can get fast. What I like about it is that for me, it's much easier to do those things where like I'll write a sentence and I'll know like, mm, I need a two syllable word. I don't know what it is. And I just draw a line and keep going. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. and this is the thing I find really helpful. I can write stuff and I know it's not perfect. I can just write in the margin fix or worse. There's mm -hmm. a lot of profanity in my in my drafts, <laughs> but, um, but I can write that. And then it's a placeholder. It sort of says to myself, yes, I know. I know it's not there. I'm under no illusions. That was not a good paragraph, mm -hmm. but I'm moving on. And mm -hmm. I know you can do that on the keyboard, but it's just that little extra step of how do you format that? And how do you put that into you highlight? Do you bold? And I know people have found their ways, but for me, it's much easier to just write it in the margins really fast and then keep going mm -hmm. or do arrows or, or you know, if people listening can't see that I'm like making all kinds of <laughs> He's making it's fantastic all gestures right Lots, now. Yes. <laughs> it's my Mediterranean nature. Is, I'm Greek. She's acting it out right yeah. in front of us. <laughs> right. So, well, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess equally as interesting to me is this next question, <clears throat> which Bill and I always go round and round about. Um, it's very fun. We're very opposite on this. Um, I'm a pantser. Bill's a plotter. Uh, we know there are people in between. We're two extremes. Um, what is your choice? Or what were, maybe you don't, I don't have a choice. I can't use a spreadsheet or anything that's actually going to um, organize me. So that's just my nature. What, where, yeah. where do you land on the line? I think I wish I were a plotter because I've had those moments where I get to a place and poof, it's a brick wall. <laughs> you know? um, right. But I think I'm a, I think I'm a planter. I know that's like a, 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 a planter. A, that's the greatest yeah. word. Yes. <laughs> a combo. What, I, what I've learned though is like, uh, here's what I've learned. Like for me, I've learned that I really need to know the character really well. Mm 
Okay. And I emphasize this in my classes too. It's like, you really need to know what the character wants. And the, Lisa Cron, who, who has the brilliant story genius book has this usage that I really find helpful of the misbelief. So it's not just the writer wants something and there's an obstacle, but it's the writer wants something and the writer, sorry, the reader character, the character wants something. Oh. It's not just the character wants something and there's an external obstacle. It's the character wants something and the character holds on to a misbelief about themselves or about the world. And the misbelief is getting in their way of achieving their goal. And I think that's, a much truer way to think about character and mm -hmm. it's built in story because you've, it you've is. got movement, you've got development, mm -hmm. um, you've got an obstacle, but it's just an obstacle that you have to figure out is in the character. And, and then your story is going to involve the character's growth, right? The character is coming to understanding of themselves. So I really try to focus on the character and also kind of know maybe where my end goal is like vaguely, mm -hmm. but I find that I did this with um, actually with the novel I'm working on now, I plotted it to within an inch of its life. And then I got bored. I was mm -hmm. like, well, now I know. So I don't need to write it. And I had to step away and I had to write this completely other narrative. I wrote a whole other draft of a whole other project. And then I came back to the novel again and I was like, well, I'm still not ready. And I added a whole other narrative thread that I knew nothing about. Cause so, so for me, I think you have to have questions that you, the writer don't know the answer to mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. know the big question, but the immediate ones, I think you have to have those same questions the way you want the reader to have them. And that's going to pull you through the story. That that's just that's how I work. I'm fascinated by something you said about uh, you know basically not being in a hurry, perhaps because mm. I spent most of my career with deadlines, so mm. it wasn't really an option. And I always thought you start something, got to, and in my mind I think, but once I finish this, then I can goof off and do. Other, except I never goof off. I finish and think, okay, what can I write now? Yeah. And uh, but uh, but you're able maybe because there is no deadline you're able to write the book that you want to write and write it to the best it can turn out to be does that make sense is that what i'm I hearing think, from you i think that's what i'm trying to do that's what i'm trying to do right now is yeah i had a sense of like come on come on get another one out there go 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 and then right. it doesn't always like that's not a very good way to produce good art i think mm -hmm. for most of us yeah so yeah. And I think it also, it takes the pressure off. It's a lot of it is you're kind of, you want to create a positive feedback loop for yourself. And so biting mm -hmm. off smaller increments of work make you feel like, Hey, I did that. Awesome. Let's move mm -hmm. on to the next thing. It'd be like if you're training for a marathon and you say, okay, on day one, I'm going to go run a 20 miler. You're going to fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you probably aren't going to run another step for another two months. But if you say, Oh, I'm going to do it one mile today and then two miles tomorrow and you know building it's like that i feel like you have to give yourself goals that are manageable and then if you outpace the goals then that's wonderful and that helps keep you motivated in the project so that's another reason i'm sort of trying to keep the goals smaller and more immediate and try to remind myself that i need to enjoy this the activity mm -hmm. of doing the writing yeah, good for you. You mentioned <laughs> you're you're working on something else right now. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah. Um, well, it's like halfway through, and um, oh. it comes from you know halfway through a first draft. So who knows, right? But um, it comes from this sort of there was a cold case in my town that remains from my childhood an unsolved disappearance. I don't know if it's a murder or not. Nobody knows. And I, um, I, you know how these things happen. I've known about this my whole life. I've, I've thought about it on and off. And then there came a time when I kept thinking about it. I just kept thinking about it. And so as with the Terra Nova thing, I couldn't get it out of my mind except by deciding to write about it. And so I'm also, I, I started thinking about, um, I'm the daughter of an engineer and I grew up with, you know, heat exchange and uh, conservation of energy and all these things. And so I began to think about a character whose mother had disappeared, who might be a physicist and w would have the reaction of like, 
sort of magical thinking that if if she could only create a world in which nothing is ever lost to entropy, then somehow her mother would would not be lost. And of course, she as a physicist, she knows that's impossible. We, that there is entropy. Um, but so that kind of I put those two things together. And that's kind of what I'm working with. Mm-hmm. Sounds fascinating. We'll watch for that. Mm-hmm. Hey, Henriette, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This was such a great conversation, Bill. Thank you, Renee. It was great. wonderful. Hey, since it's December, let me mention that I wrote a Christmas story uh, featuring Kinsey Rivera from my Splitsville novels. That's what Jesse was referring to earlier because he I, I read it. He's doing the production on the audio book. It's predictably titled Yuletide Splitsville. And you can not only find the short story, but the audio book read by me at Amazon and other online bookseller. I mean, it's just the thing to get you in the Hollywood spirit. Crime, right? <laughs> and if you haven't joined the WriterCon Facebook group yet, please do. It's a wonderful community of writers. Until next time, everybody, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.